Hello, this is Breuer, and this is a pretty exciting day. I am going to do a first impressions video of the newly announced Civilization VI expansion, Rise and Fall. So we're going to go ahead and go through the uh, the little write-up blurb here on the Civilization VI website and uh, kind of see what's going on here. First little bit here, it says, Civilizations are not set in stone. You can't just do all the hard work in the beginning, then expect your culture to stand the test of time unchallenged. It's not like that in the real world or in civilization games. The expansion, uh, I guess they're announcing today, is Civilization VI Rise and Fall. Adds new dynamic layers onto the game you've already been enjoying. And it comes out February 8th. Very awesome. That's only about, what, 10 weeks away. You will lead nations to Golden Ages. Okay, we've seen Golden Ages before. Uh, you'll watch others buckle down under their own weight, or buckle under their own weight. You will earn or lose the loyalty of your people. Hmm... And the question is, how will you be remembered? All right, so here's the trailer. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get in here and watch this trailer real quick, and then we'll have some super comments. I might actually pause it along the way, and we'll see what what comes up. So let's let's get this started. Daughter, the path has not always been easy, but you have never faltered. Ours is a journey that spans generations. Where one story ends, another begins. The world our ancestors faced was brutal. Yet from it, they drew life. And though the road to prosperity was at times harsh. All right, I'm going to pause it right here for a second. Um... Just because, I don't know, uh, we see this is another Roman type theme. I don't know if they're actually going to give us hints of what the new civilizations are. Because there's going to be, I think, eight new civilizations and nine new leaders. And so I don't know if they're going to give us new hints about that through this video. But what if they are? Um, if there's nine new leaders, that doesn't necessarily mean one of those leaders is going to be for one of those civs. It could be a new one for maybe Rome. And that's why we're seeing some Roman stuff here. I don't know. Let's keep it going. <laughs> From it, great civilizations arose. I mean, here's another one, uh, kind of an Asian themed. Um, I, mean, I guess she could be Chinese. I mean, it's, is it possible? I don't know the architecture that well. Is it possible? As well as that there's some Korean influences there. I don't think we have a Korea right now. In fact, Seoul is actually a city state. So we've seen Korea in the past. Why not bring another Korea back? Um, could, maybe there's a female leader for Korea that they could bring up that uh, to increase the number of, of female uh, um, civilization leaders that we have. We'll see. Those who would oppose them with dreams of conquest of their own. Okay, so this one's too obvious. Come on. We're going to get a Genghis Khan, right? Or some some Khan or something like that. I think we've had Genghis Khan and was it, what's the other one? Kublai? I don't remember who the other ones are. We've had multiple Khans in the past, so we've got to be getting another one with the horse archers and stuff. Come on. Creating mighty empires. To see them fall. Hmm. So this looks very like Renaissance or maybe Dark Age. I don't know, something like that. I guess the Dark Ages is one of the things that they're gonna be coming out with. I don't know if there's any like civilization we can read from this or not. Um I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's anybody we can come up with. Yet from the ashes of the old. Of course they gotta kill off Sean Bean again. Possibilities Come on now. Possibilities arise. You need only persevere. For you some sort of seafaring guys? Um do we have 
Dutch in this one yet. I don't think we've seen Dutch, right? <laughs> I haven't played all the Sims. I don't think I've seen them. I mean, we have like uh, Norway uh, or like the, the Vikings, if you will. Um, who else? I mean, obviously England seafaring, which we've already got them. Spain, you know, conquistadors, stuff like that. We've already got them. Um, but yeah, maybe something like the Netherlands or something. United. Mankind is capable of many things, both great and terrible. Still, the true power to shape this world has always lain in your hands. Choose well. Always. Yeah, and th there at the end, we have, um, you know, obviously the Berlin Wall coming down like that. We've already got Germany in the game, so that, that can't be a reference to that. It's probably just a, a time in history that they were showing. Um, at the very, very end, that looked like a presidential stand in, in like the United States, um, which unfortunately we don't have a, a, a female, you know, president or anything like that we can go with. But it's possible they could come up with another American leader. doesn't have to be a president, I suppose, that that's a female. Um I expect, let's just put it this way. I expect to see more female leaders this go around. I don't think they're going to all be female leaders, um, but I definitely think we're going to see a lot more as well than we've already seen. Um, so anyway, let's get going with the rest of this. Um, we'll ignore what, I guess, Anton here is, is uh, introducing himself. So Golden Age and Dark Ages are coming. The Golden Ages and Dark Ages are among the new events that could shift the course of your game's history. They are significant but temporary changes to a civilization that lasts for an era. Okay, so like um, like the Industrial Era or the, the Renaissance Era, things like that. They open up new opportunities for players to change their strategies and change the state of the game between the player and the rivals. Having a Golden Age affords huge bonuses to loyalty, another mechanic that we haven't really seen yet, and other game systems, but makes earning future Golden Ages slightly more difficult. So you get in a Golden Age, that's awesome for your civilization, but it makes it harder to get future ones. Okay, that's fine. Dark Ages hurts loyalty in your cities, it makes you vulnerable. So Dark Ages are sort of bad, but gives you an opportunity to earn future Golden Ages more easily. Okay, so you can do a golden, uh, Dark Age followed by a Golden Age probably a lot quicker. Um, it also allows the use of special Dark Age policies and opens the door for an even more powerful Heroic Age. So, sounds like there's a possibility of maybe flip-flopping flip back and forth between Golden Age, Dark Age, Golden Age, Dark Age. That way your Golden Ages, when you get them, are super powerful and maybe you can mitigate some of the negatives of the, the heroic age. It's also possible that you line it up where just before your civilization gets into like a a strength era of their own, like maybe where the unique unit comes in or unique building or or something along those lines, you you do a dark age in the the one before it, the era before that, so that way you have a golden age when you're at your prime already with all your your uh, you know bonuses and tech boosts and stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, Golden Age provides one dedicated bonus. Uh, Heroic Age lets the player earn three, sorry, dedication dedication bonuses, earn three dedication bonuses, making it sort of a triple Golden Age. So I guess this is some sort of thing you can pick, maybe along the lines of one of the civic uh, choices where it's like, you know, builders can build faster or things like that. Who knows? Maybe it's even bigger than that. I actually don't know. That's going to be interesting to see how these dedication bonuses come into play. Um, so then it goes into, you know, we got the idea of player eras. Uh, and this expansion systems are very much tied to the idea of the game era, which is determined by individual player advancements and a, a few other behind the seat adjustments. Think of these game eras like chapters in a book, okay? Each has its own arc and its own small ending, but leaves you wanting to discover the rest of the story by continuing to the next chapter. Sounds kind of cool. When you enter a new game era, you may earn a dark, a golden age or a dark age. Which one you get is determined by your era score in the previous game era a score that is increased by fulfilling a certain objectives. I kind of like the idea of, of having little goals, little mini goals that you go towards along the way as you're, as you're kind of trying to take over the rest of the world. 
So that's kind of interesting. And use those to play into your, like I said, all right, when am I going to attack the rest of the, the, the civilizations around me? Well, that's going to be when I get my golden age, but I got to suffer through a dark age before I do that. So we'll see if I can survive that dark age, not use, lose too much loyalty, which I think we'll get into that here in a minute, and then have that golden age spawn at just the right time so I can go out and uh, take over the world, if you will, or, or maybe a scientific advancement of some sorts. Um, so while your neighbor may ha have been in a golden age last era, uh, they may enter a dark age this era, opening up an opportunity for you to change your strategy. See, that's another thing. We'll have to see where other people's dark ages come in and see when they're vulnerable. The key effect of Golden Dark Ages, they change the loyalty of a player's cities. As ages change and weak spots are exposed in empires, cities can declare independence and even change hands to new owners. Okay. Cities can declare independence and even change hands to new owners. Okay, this is this is big. This is obviously huge. All right, we've seen in the past, what was it, Civ 3 or 4, where you could use culture you know, bombs and like some of the, I think it was like the musicians and things like that to like spread your culture enough that flip cities over to your culture. Um, but this is, um, this is different. This is, they're using loyalty for this mechanic now. Um, but then the cities can declare independence. That's new. I don't think I've, I don't remember any civilization game that's had that. So I'm guessing effectively the city becomes like a city state of its own. I wonder if it has like kind of some baseline pseudo bonuses, you know, where, you know, it kind of, um, I don't know. I wonder if it operates in any way like a city state at that point, or if it's still just a, a city sitting out there that anybody could take. It's interesting to think about. Um, so here's a screenshot. Uh, one thing I did want to take note of in this particular screenshot is what is this back here? This green step looking, whatchamacallit. It's got to be at least what? At least four tiles, like three across and one up here. And it seems like it's situated very perfectly in these mountains. Um, if it was not completely green, I would be wondering like, maybe is this some sort of like Grand Canyon or something like that? But there's a lot of waterfalls and stuff. So maybe there's, I don't know what else this could be. I'd have to look up I'm a little, little, uh, it's been a while since I've had my geography classes to remember what kind of a other formation has this particular shape. Um, but I'm guessing this is one of the new natural wonders. And so we'll see what that comes out to be. Um, uh, what else we got here? Is there anything else we could see in this picture that would be new? I don't think think I'm seeing anything. Uh, I'm not sure what this wonder is. I don't remember it, but it's possible this one's already in the game. So I'm not going to jump to any conclusions yet just because I don't remember them because I don't personally build a lot of wonders because I play a lot of deity games and it's really hard to get wonders in deity, but it's possible there's a new wonder. We'll see. Earning loyalty. So, okay, here we go. The stakes of the new loyalty system are huge because uh, at the extremes, they can flip control of entire cities to different players without military force. So this is a new way for you to expand your empire without actually having to go to war, which is interesting to think about. I mean, um, you can be like very defensive. You still need a military, obviously, because if you start flipping people's cities, they're going to start flipping out on you <laughs> and uh, coming after you. So you need to still need a defensive military. But maybe if you're kind of going for a, a, you know, a religious victory or a culture victory, something like that, you don't need to go out and conquer people. You just need to flip their cities peacefully, if you will. I'm sure they won't think it too peaceful. But anyway, low loyalty in a city puts it at risk of rebelling and becoming a free city. That in turn makes a juicy target for other players looking to expand their own empire. Keeping your cities loyal not only keeps it on your side, but also emanates its loyalty as a kind of peer pressure to other cities nearby. You could even sway cities from other civilizations to join you. So you peer pressure. That's interesting. And in other previous civilization games, there's a way to culture flip another pre uh, player city without military intervention. Okay, that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, we felt it was time to re-examine this non-militaristic way to change borders and expand territory. Very, very fascinating. Loyalty also changes the landscape and strategy around the map as the game continues. The landscape? What could have been an unchanging border between two civilizations in the base game becomes a contentious battleground of loyalties and expansion, especially when Golden Ages or Dark Ages are involved. Man, that's tough. I mean, you're going to... It probably may may take away from some of that forward settling of guys. If you're about to get into a dark age, you don't want to forward settle somebody because you're going to have a city right next to them that's going to have no loyalty. They're going to flip over to their side imme immediately. You're basically giving them a free city. That's not the kind of forward settling you, that's very productive. But um, if you think you're about to get a golden age, maybe that's when you put a city right next to them, get your golden age, and you're emanating a lot of good loyalty over to them. That's maybe a possibility. Uh, golden ages and dark ages are kind of a loyalty bomb. And the best case scenario is triggering a golden age makes all your citizens a bit more loyal. 
Uh, also, other cities uh, nearby, you see the appeal of the civilization and may waver in their loyalty to the current owner. The quickest and most direct way to boost loyalty, though, is to send a governor to the city. Ah, I like the nice, uh, nice, um, what am I trying to say? Transition to the next one. Um, governor's rule. Okay, what in the world? In previous versions of civilization, governor often referred to the AI behavior you could set for a city to act on your behalf. Yes. Go tell this governor to go be food focused or, or gold focused or whatever. Okay. Makes sense. That's not what this is, though, right? Uh, in this expansion, though, they are the opposite. Opposite, okay? Sending a governor to a city is a way for the player to make an active decision about the development of one of their cities and grow in a specific direction. Much like how districts operate in the base game, governors are a way to specialize your cities. The difference, governors have their own set of unique, powerful bonuses and can move between controlled cities. All right, this is starting to sound a lot like if you've ever played Endless Space 2 or Endless Space 1, I suppose, um, where you could put a governor. Um, actually, I don't know if it's called governor in that game. I think it is uh, a governor in um, in, in uh, over one of your your systems, you know, with all your planets and stuff like that. That's, you know, you can kind of level up in sort of a, a specialized way and say, hey, make this one. Uh, this is really good against with food and production. So a brand new city, put this governor in there and that system's going to. Uh, explode pretty early on, be able to get some of its basic buildings very, very quickly. Uh, and then you might have another governor who's maybe more on the gold and the science side of things. So once a system or um, in that game, or maybe in this game, a city is established, you put a governor there that's really good at the science or the gold or some of those other late game things, maybe some faith, something like that. And you've got a really good city, you put them in there and you're actually getting even more. You know, let's say, what if a governor had 50% more science, uh, you know, in a city. Well, go find your best city that has science, put your, put your governor in there, and now you're getting a whole bunch of science out of that. I don't know if that's how it's going to work, but maybe along those lines, because that's how it works in other games. But um, that's kind of fascinating. During a game, players can earn up to seven governors. Each governor has different skill tree of promotions. Okay, so there's going to be a skill tree. That's good. Uh, we bent a lot of existing game rules to give them the power to make a difference in your cities. Fascinating. Uh, here's how it works. You earn governor points, governor titles earn points, sorry, uh, through gameplay. When Then you must choose whether to spend those points on appointing a new governor or promoting an existing one. How you choose to manage your governors will impact your overall strategy, go wide by covering more cities, or go tall by promoting only a few powerful governors. Interesting. As for the governors themselves, they have unique personalities. Even before you start choosing which ones to upgrade, some thrive in taking an already established city to the next level. Okay, that's what I was talking about earlier, where you, you, you kind of help them build things and, and, and kind of grow quicker. Um, building wonders, empowering up trade routes. Okay, cool. Others are more suited to new. Oh, no, actually, this is the this is the established city. Okay, sorry, that's the one with the science or the uh, like I said, gold or whatever like that. Uh, the others are more suited to new cities that are constructing their first districts and claiming their first bits of land. Exactly what I mentioned about you know good amount of food or good amount of early production that they can get those those early like I said districts out of the way to get that city off the ground. One can be a savior during city siege. Okay, that's cool. Someone who's very defensive minded. Uh, one can make uh, or break a city's defense against powerful attacking armor or army, I should say. So maybe you've gone from like a, a city strength of like 50 and you put a governor in there and he gives you 50% more or something like that. You're at 75, you know, in an early age or something like that. I don't know if that's how it's going to work. Uh, what if you give you an extra city attack or what if you give you more range on your city attack? Who knows? Though normally governors can only work in your own cities, there's one that can be assigned to city states affecting the envoys you have there. That said, none of the governors are easily distilled into a single function. So a lot of these governors look like they might have a strength, but not necessarily a single focus. So they can kind of maybe do a few other things as well. That's interesting. Um, my only fear about governors is that if you can earn them and you're competing against the other civilizations, then on some of those deity games, it might be ridiculously hard to ever get a governor, which will put you way behind and kind of completely eliminate this entire system. Like I mentioned before, it's really, really hard to get wonders in, in deity games. That's not impossible. Don't get me wrong. You could definitely get them if you plan for them and go for them. But it is a challenge. And most of the civilizations are going to beat you to those. Same thing with um, the current uh, you know, great scientists and great um, great profits for sure. Although recently they've made a change where that makes it easier for us to get them in, in the higher levels, but great profits and great generals and great, you know, admirals, things like that. They're really, really hard to get those high levels because the other, you know, cities are, are, are getting them so quickly. So if the governors operate the same way, uh, it's going to be very frustrating because, you know, I want to play with this. I want to use this, especially in those high level data games, but we'll see, we'll see how it comes into play. Um, what else is on here? Okay, so look look at this picture for a second. Uh, there's a few things here. 
for one, what is this? I have no idea what that is. It's some sort of sea-based, I don't know, recycling water filtration something? I don't know. Um, what is this? Is this is this the farm that we've seen before? I feel like it looks different than I remember. Um, this is obviously new, right? I don't think I remember the Statue of Liberty. Again, I don't build a lot of wonders. We've had Statue of Liberty in past games, so I'm forgetting if it's in Civ 6 right now because I don't build it. Uh, and then we what has got here? The... Um, what is this? Is this like, it's not Coney Island, right? Or something like that. Or I don't remember what that would be, but I feel like that's another, like a wonder or something like that. Um, I'm sure there's a few other things in this picture that I'm missing that, that are pretty cool. This truck doesn't look familiar. Maybe it's just a general trade route, but it looks a little different to me. But anyway, enhancing your alliances. Uh, alliances within Civilization VI already offered a lot, but this expansion adds more nuance. Okay. Alliances in the base game often boil down to sort of guarantee that the other player would not interfere with your strategy by attacking you. All right. I've been doing that in my current games where I'm like, all right, I don't really expect you to help me, but I'm going to ally you just so I don't ever have to worry about you attacking me, which is exactly what happens. But only rarely did it uh, offer tangible benefits. Makes sense. So for Civilization VI Rise and Fall, we added more tangible incentives to alliances, encouraging players to band together for mutual benefit rather than merely non-interference. We're also giving players more active and flavorful choices to make. Alliances now have a type, research, military, economic, cultural, or religious, that determines their benefits. Moreover, as the alliance continues, the alliance itself levels up and unlocks, unlocks more powerful bonuses. This encourages players to think in the long term and to invest in diplomacy. Now, isn't this like um, in Civ Beyond Earth, maybe, where you can have um, kind of diplomatic agreements with other people where... As it levels up, you get more science and more, um, you know, production or, or more trade route type stuff. I feel like that's, it's been too long since I've played Beyond Earth. Uh, I'm going to have to play it again soon because, I don't know, I kind of like it a little bit. It's not the greatest civilization game, but it's definitely worth playing every once in a while. Um, sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent, but I feel like that's like that system where you can um, have that kind of level up agreement with somebody else. Um Let's see, I'll give you an example of how an alliance can evolve over time, specifically a research alliance. At level one, both allies receive science bonuses to their trade routes, so you'd want to trade with that ally over anybody else. That makes sense. But as the alliance develops, powerful and unique effects come into play. At level two, both allies still receive the science bonus, but also receive one tech boost at a regular interval. Cool. Level three is all of the above plus bonus science when researching the same technology. So that's like how, um, if you play a multiplayer game right now, um, and then the second part of this, or technology your ally has already researched. If you play a multiplayer game right now, you can set it up where anytime your allies research something, you get that bonus. But currently in uh, the computer, like against uh, NPC players, you don't have that benefit. Um, these alliances are powerful enough that players are restricted to just one alliance of each type at a time. Okay, so one research, one military, one economic, one culture, one religion. I don't know if you'd ever have all five, but I guess it's an option at this point. Um, but you and your alliance partner can agree to change the type of your alliance later in the game. Cool. Alliances sound cool. I'm glad that they've recently fixed a bug where like the computer guys would never ally with you. Like it was impossible. So hopefully they can do some more of that where they're more inclined to ally you, especially like the guys that, you know, are really strong in research. I want to get a research ally alliance with them. Hopefully they kind of lean towards that if, if that will play to my, uh, my goals. Um, I think we're almost down here. Yep. Uh, emergency situations. Okay. This one's interesting. Emergencies are new with civilization six. Uh, rise and fall. Most emergencies get triggered when one player gets a significant lead or advantage in an area. Converting a holy city to a different religion, which I've had happen within the first like 20 turns of the game. I mean, not that early, but very, very early in the game. Um, or using nuclear weapons, for example. Okay. When triggered, the game determines which other players can join in an emergency against the target. And each player can choose to join or pass. Joining can give permanent benefits. Permanent benefits. Okay. I didn't... I had kind of briefly read through this earlier, but I didn't see the permanent benefits part. But only if the player players are able to complete an emergency specific objective against the target in time. Otherwise, the target gets a benefit instead. I wonder if that the target's benefit would be uh, permanent as well. Uh, presumably so. Uh, there are sort of checks and balances system. You see, there's a delicate balance to strike, making the game more dynamic and also ensuring it stays fair for players who have developed a strong lead. Uh, we're adding challenges to players who'd go so far ahead of others that the game stagnated towards victory for them. Yeah, makes sense to me. We also did not want to artificially rubber band them down. So you didn't want to just, all right, you're so far ahead. Now all your research is cut in half or all your production is cut in half. That would be 
That would be terrible. <laughs> terrible, terrible. Emergency has become a great way to attack this game pacing problem. It also reveals the dynamic world stage for players that have more isolationist play styles. As emergencies come up, they can be involved with them one way or another. I'm assuming another way for this to come into play because this is the one that gets me the most in, in all of my data games is somebody gets so far ahead in the space race that it's like, what can I do now? Like, there's literally nothing I can do. So if like, as they start getting that further ahead in the space race, an emergency pops up and everybody can band together to go, you know, destroy one of, you know, all of their spaceports or something along those lines, that would be pretty cool. Um, now, obviously, presumably this can happen to you as well, but, you know, you would plan for that. You expect these emergencies to come up for the, the other guys and, and you, uh, you act defensively in that case. So, interesting. Retelling your history. Fans of Civilization know that each game plays out in its own way, very true, with its own unique story. Uh, with Rise and Fall, we are bringing the story into a spotlight by adding more ways to track the progress of a player's civilization than ever before. So as players progress in, in Rise and Fall, they can earn his, historic moments. These are many achievements for doing cool things in the world, and there are over a hundred of them in the game right now. Wow. That's fascinating. They include things like circumnavigating the world. Cool. Training your unique unit. Awesome. Founding a religion, building districts with a high adjacency bonus. Okay, so all these are pretty cool. Pretty easy things to do within the course of a normal game, but also some that you might be like, you know what? I'm actually pretty close to circumnavigating, circumnavigating the globe. Or, or maybe I, I want a beeline for circumnavigating the world to just kind of get this this thing, you know, this historic moment to make my story cool. Uh, that might be kind of cool. Many grant an even bigger bonus if you're the world's first civilization to make the achievement. So there are bonuses to come to play. There's not just a pretty picture that you get to hang on your wall. It's actually a bonus that can come into play. So maybe you circumnavigate the world and you get plus one movement to your ships. Who knows? Um, that could come in handy. These historic moments taken together form a story for your game with unique details tailored to your empire. Historic moments are represented two ways. First, they increase your era score, helping you achieve golden age. Perfect. Makes sense. Second, they're added to your timeline, which is a place in the UI that displays all your accomplishments in a game. This timeline has tons of custom illustrations for each different moment and is a very cool representation of your empire's history during your unique game. On a more practical note, it is also a useful way to remind yourself of what you've been up to if you return to a save game after a few days away. Okay, so let's get it, keep it practical. Ultimately, the timeline is a way to illustrate your story. I mean, obviously the bonuses that you get to the golden age and stuff like that is is going to be beneficial and you're going to be able to plan for that and play for that. Uh, this other part, you know, the the graphical illustration is is just a cool feature. It's not anything that's going to change the game in any way, but it is a, it's a cool feature. So that's kind of cool. I like that. Um, anything in this picture? What is this? The satellite dish and a, um, it's like a, the habitat thing, the moon habitat. That's, is that something you actually build on the ground? Again, I've actually not gotten that far with the science of victory. So if these are things that are already in the game, I'm sorry, but I've actually not gotten that far. All my victories have been like conquest um, or f I've had a faith victory and things like that. I haven't gotten far enough in a science victory to, to see what the uh, the Mars landing thing looks like. I thought it was just something that was just you finished and it's something arbitrary out there. If it's actually something on the ground, that's cool. I need to look around at some of the other civilizations in my current game to see if they have it that I can see. Um, anything else here that I see that would jump out at me? I don't see anything. Uh, the Kremlin is the Kremlin. That's a Kremlin, right? I'm going to be completely wrong on that. I'm sure. And I apologize, but I feel like that might be it. Is that in the game currently? Again, I know it's been in the past games. I don't remember if it's in the current game. I get it so confused. All right. New civilizations, new leaders. People often ask how we select new leaders and etc. We have nine new leaders and eight new civilizations, which will be revealed over the coming weeks. So I'm presumably believe with there's like 10 weeks to go before the expansion, they're probably going to introduce one each week. You know, this this week was the expansion itself. Next week will probably be a new leader. I'm guessing. Now it may come sooner than that. We'll see. Um, and that kind of goes into details about how they uh, they kind of design new leaders. Um, I think it does say, yeah, they definitely want to include more female leaders, which is going to be exciting to see. Um, kind of learn some of their stories and kind of understand, you know, what their... Uh, impact on history has been because a lot of those are kind of don't pop up very often uh and i'm sure they're gonna be doing some balancing with some of the current civilizations to make them play nicely with the other ones but yeah no this is fascinating civilization six or the rise and fall i'm excited i can't wait february 8th it's 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 only a few weeks away um and i will definitely be doing let's plays of this as soon as this comes out so hopefully you like this little bit of a first impression video um 
If you did, please, you know, give me a like or whatever. And um, if not, that's fine. I understand. If you've got some comments, some thoughts, what do you think is going to come into play? How do you think some of these systems are going to work? Please let me know. I do like this picture. This is really, really cool. I like, I like that way it builds off of the older one with another kind of statue kind of look. This is very cool. But anyway, thank you again for watching. And uh, I do appreciate it. And I hope you join me again uh, next time. Thank you and goodbye.